So I came out of 2019, the summer, um, you know, with with two individual world records to my name, and I was the favorite to win, you know, gold in multiple events at Tokyo. Honestly, we had just come back in November of 2019 from World Championships, and so I had just won, and I had just broken the world record, and so I was on a pretty high, you know, I was I was riding pretty high. I was just riding this really, really great wave um, going into the summer of 2020. We were getting ramped up for our qualifiers, getting ready to peak, really good vibes and good feelings. You know, we're planning for the end of that summer to become something special. In 2020, I was in my second semester of college. We were in a study room of five or six people and one kid's like, oh, there's something crazy happening, COVID-19 or something. And you're like, ah, whatever, and we, and we just blew them off. I think like everybody, we heard the rumors. When we first heard about it, it was just like, you know, oh, okay, you know, it's just a big flu thing, you know, whatever. It really wasn't until we were in Spain training for our world championship in March that you heard from different countries. Italy pulled out and required their sailors to come home. The Chinese didn't come, like just certain, certain countries didn't go. And these are all of our friends that are just packing their boats up and leaving. I remember the day, it was March 13th, because that was the day that um, college and NCAA championships were beginning to get canceled. Yeah, I just remember being like, this like is not going to end well. We come into practice and they're like, it's, it's done, we're done. They like shut down all the pools, shut down the universities. You know, it was all happening all within, you know, 48 hours. They put a, a deadbolt on our, um, a chain lock on the U.S. Sailing Center where we train in Miami. I just assumed that NBC and the IOC and the IPC would just say, yeah, there, there's something going around, but we're going to push ahead. This is world sports and it's more important than anything on the globe. A few weeks later, obviously they canceled the Olympics. For me personally, it was definitely a gut wrench. Everyone just felt so like, blah. <laughs> um. I was extremely sad, you know, I, I didn't know how to take it, you know, two months in and then nothing's open still and starting to wonder, you know, should I even try to swim anymore? Having shutdowns for swimmers was, was so difficult just because you lose your feel for the water so quickly. I mean, it was the first time in, I don't know, my whole life that I've spent two months not sailing. Once I found out Olympics were canceled, I was just like, do I want to be done? We didn't know how long COVID was going to last. You know, some people were saying a year, some people were saying two years, some people were saying a lifetime. A full month after they had canceled it, um, they had moved it to 2021. Our pools began to open back up. I don't want to get the date wrong, so don't quote me, but it was like late uh, spring. The governor was allowing college students or college age students to continue to train. At least I remember that was the case at our pool and my, and my teammates that were in high school couldn't train. That was really hard to see. I felt guilty about that. Every place you go to train, it's like, are they gonna let us in or not? Where do we take our COVID tests? It's just the decisions and everything that we had to do was so far from any other year that we've sailed. I wasn't training well. I was just tired all the time. I was exhausted. Um, it was a really rough few months. And then in November, the second shutdown happened. I mean, for us, it was a blessing because we got that extra year to train. I benefited the most from having that extra year. Um, I was not ready in 2020. To just have an extra year of that hype on me building up, you know, people saying, oh, she's the one to watch, you know, like she's supposed to win gold. People expecting me to not only make the team, but to win gold. That was a lot of pressure when I hadn't even qualified for the Olympics yet. It was just, it was really brutal. From the outside, people say, okay, well, you're the world champion, you're the world record holder, you better go out there and do something. And it got really hard when I wouldn't, you know, perform very well at meets and people would just tear me apart because I wasn't doing like how they expected me to be doing based on performances over a year prior. And it just affected a lot of athletes a lot and affected me a lot. To stay healthy and to be full strength is very tough to do. I just wanted to keep going. I wanted to keep training as hard as I could, keep the momentum. That did hurt me. I should have taken some time. I should have been smart enough to know that my body wasn't gonna be able to sustain 
almost two years of straight training. It was probably month six out of the water, which by then is pretty much career ending in the world of swimming at least. I got a call from Jason Lezak and he called me and was like, hey, I have an opening on my team. Would you wanna go for ISL season two at the time? I was like, yeah. I kind of lied about it. Told him I had taken like five weeks off. Reality, it was six months. Athletes will do anything to play their sport, which is amazing to be honest. Our world championship in 2021 got moved to Portugal. U.S. citizens were banned from going to Europe. My teammates in the Coast Guard, so we had them write us a letter. Nobody knew when we could start traveling internationally. We just kind of figured it out and said, we've got to get on this plane, we've got to train. It was, it was the hardest thing I think I've ever done in the sport. We came to our world championships. We had set a goal of being top eight at that regatta, and then also another goal of qualifying for the Olympics. The International Paralympic Committee and the Tokyo Games give you a, a certain amount of slots for your team. You've got to perform at that meet if you want to make the team. Trials is by far the most stressful meet I've ever been a part of. Five years like leading up to like this week was honestly horrifying. All that work you've done, put in one minute of racing. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, I like couldn't drink water. I just like, I couldn't do anything. I was just so nervous. You know, you put a lot of pressure on yourself. A lot of people put pressure on you. NBC's there, you know, and, and I wouldn't say that we have that kind of coverage for everything. They say that um, the swimming trials is harder than the actual Olympics, and I completely agree. Yeah, I, I ate a lot of Tums that week. We finished seventh overall and qualified, and that was, I mean, I think I'll never, ever forget that feeling. <laughs> it was just a huge sigh of relief. Try to hold back the tears. You know, it was, um, it was a lot of emotions all at once. The last day of the meet was June 20th, and I went home on Monday, June 21st, and I had six days to get my stuff together and turn around and get on a plane and go to Honolulu for training camp. We went straight to uh, Tokyo after that. We were on a United flight. Um, they flew the US athletes. You had to do some testing before you left. We have to test negative for COVID twice before we leave. And then we have to also test negative every day while we're in Japan. Once we got to the airport, you know, you did all the COVID tests. We get off the airplane and we're put through probably 10 to 12 different checkpoints. We did a saliva test and then had to fill out all these documents, take our temperature. It was not some like rushed 15 minute test. It was one of those that take hours. They told us to prepare for four hours in the airport. That process was about six hours to be honest. After an international flight, you're exhausted, you're hungry, you wanna take a shower. And we just had to sit in this room for so long. Everyone was like getting extremely delirious and just like not having a good time. I think a lot of the athletes were just so scared to test positive and their dreams would get crashed for no reason. My first test was positive. I spent the next two days testing to, to make sure that that was a false positive, which it ended up obviously being. It becomes very difficult and very stressful from a psychological standpoint. Uh, not only are you gonna travel 12 hours on an airplane and be on a different day when you get there, you got all this other stuff. We didn't get back to the village for the first time until 2.30 a.m. I remember falling into bed and going to sleep around 1.30. There's a whole process with getting checked in. We have to eat as well. Luckily, there's a 24-hour dining hall, so we're, we were able to get a lot of good food. In the cafeteria, it was funny. You had plexiglass all around you, so you were just like in your little cubicle eating your meal. <laughs> Let me tell you about this. So we walk in to, to go eat and Right behind me is, not arguably, he is the best power lifter of the history of the Olympics, the guy from Georgia. And then to my left, you'll have Kenyan runners that are 36, 37 years old, going for their third, fourth gold medal. In front of me, you'd have Luka Doncic from Slovenia, who's 22 year old superstar in the NBA. I saw one woman who was a shooter and she's from Sri Lanka. And this woman looks like my grandma and she's an Olympian. I wish everybody could see this because you literally can be any body shape and be the best at any sport you want to be at. And you realize that everything is mental. You don't have to look a certain way to be exceptional at something, which I feel like can be a stereotype for athletes. Like you have to look a certain way to be a good athlete. <laughs> I thought these people are fake. Like this is real deal, baby. So to see that 
Every day was amazing for me. The village in Tokyo was amazing. They put a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of effort into making this a great Olympics, even though uh, it was COVID. You do feel an aura of, of how special the environment is supposed to be. You know, we wore masks everywhere and outside we wore them as well. And that made it hard to hear others. So like you'd be trying to have a conversation with someone and you'd be like screaming at them. You didn't really talk to too many people you didn't know. The countries that came there and they were happy to be there, okay, they were more social. But the countries like the USA, Great Britain, Australia, the, Russia, those type of countries, the players that are coming there for gold, it's a different thing for them. As much as I would love to, to befriend more people and, and to talk about their experiences, it's, it's not worth me maybe potentially even exposing myself to COVID or someone who's been around someone who had COVID. Why would I want to jeopardize the last five years of my life? You did hear the chatter of the, the teams that were supposed to win. Going into the finals, I was the number one seed. Um, and that, that's like a lot of pressure. Going into a final, being seeded to win the gold medal, when you have an extremely talented field of girls around you, that was really hard. There was a huge expectation from not only the people around me, but from Team USA, from NBC, who you know came and followed my, my family and I for the couple of days. You know, the anticipation of me winning was there. They they didn't see us winning. They saw the Russians winning, actually. We were never favored. Um, our world championship in 2019, we finished 31st, I think. So to make that huge leap up into seventh, we didn't have any pressure on us, which was awesome, but we put pressure on ourselves, of course. I started to say, hey, I'm here. I want to remember this as a good thing, so let's just focus on the basketball. You sort of lose the fact that there's cameras everywhere, that there's cameras actually on the floor at the back of the ring. When you get to the boat park in the morning, the helicopters are already up in the air right above your head. So you have that all day. We had two security guards from the State Department. Cameras are on you all the time. On our race course, we had drones in our face. You know the cameras are all up in your face when you're about to swim. You know people are watching, millions of people are watching. You know, when you look at that camera, you know you're looking at your family, your friends, people that know you. People that don't know you, people from all around the world are watching the Olympics. If you look around too much and you like see the cameras and know everyone's watching you, for sure you're not gonna play as well. My first individual event was the 100 backstroke. Looking up at the clock, it was not my best swim ever. I came away with the bronze. Something was off and I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out right at the moment. It, it just didn't feel like one of those days where I was gonna last one off. And then going into that finals of the 200 butterfly, I was seated fourth. I just wanted to medal again so badly for Team USA. As soon as I dove in and hit the water, it's all instincts. This is something I've pictured almost every day for years. I took it out a little bit too fast because I was pumped up and excited. I don't know what happened, but I just, I got this rush of adrenaline. My vision was just like tunneled. I was seeing black around. I served the right serve. I hit hit a perfect ball. I just remember hitting the wall and seeing that I, A, won a best time by over a second, which is huge, and then, you know, B, I got a silver medal. To win the gold medal, it, it was, it was very special. I couldn't put it in, in words, really. Um, just overall an amazing, amazing feeling. That was like one of, I think, my favorite races of all time. It was so fun and I was just so ecstatic. And I remember smiling up at the board and realizing that like, I haven't felt this happy after a race since before the pandemic. I'm in this sport because I love it. Like, why do I never feel this way after races? I don't think people realize. I think when they see the Olympics, they're thinking everybody's happy and everything, but I actually saw the opposite. 99% of them were either mad, upset, um, or just not happy with the results. It seems like a lot of people just grind and they yell and they work hard and they, um, there's this kind of negativity and you have to beat yourself up. When you train for five years and you find yourself in a situation where you know you're the best in the world, but you didn't put the best in the world in the circle that day, it's, it's difficult. I didn't do it. I didn't, I didn't do what I set out to do. You want to be the best and gold is always the goal. And so coming away with the bronze, I think I was disappointed at first. I knew that, you know, being in that first seed position, gold was within reach, you know, and then I just didn't quite get it. I mean, it's hard to put on a smile and be like, hey, I really won the bronze medal because I don't feel that way. I feel like 
I got the bronze medal, man. The rowing team, they had come for a medal and they finished like maybe eighth. One girl was crying, talking to one of my teammates. Another girl is just upset. You guys are the eighth best in the world. <laughs> like you don't, not in your country, in the world. You just hold yourself to such a high standard and if you don't do how you want to do, you can be so hard on yourself. To actually hear it come out of their mouth and see their faces was just unbelievable. I think in America, we've been conditioned to believe that you know athletes are machines and if they don't win gold, then they're not worth anything. One of the hardest things about being an athlete on Team USA is that we expect medals. And as an athlete, that's what we want for of course, that's like our, our main drive. But I see a lot of other countries, you know, they have big parades when athletes come back and they celebrate all Olympians. Walking away, not a gold medalist, and having people, you know, think that you're not good enough can be really, really hard to deal with. When you're on the same level of somebody, you don't judge them, but it's the people outside that don't see the work being put in. Those are the people that judge them. From a spectator's point of view or a fan's point of view it's just did they win a gold or a silver or a bronze or and if they won a bronze or silver they're probably not that great but it's like when you're in it and you're competing you just you can't imagine how hard it is it's always been kind of a running joke behind the scenes for olympic and paralympic athletes it's like within each one of these events there should just be one guy like a just joe and see the difference between what Joe's doing and what the best in the world is doing. Now walking away with not any goals, but two silvers and a bronze, you know, you have to have that conversation with yourself and realize like, there's so much to be proud of. We had a couple of Zoom calls, one with Dr. Biden and then one with um, Jill and Joe. And just to have them with this very select group of people on Zoom, you saw, whoa, I'm one of a very few and we're getting addressed by the president. This is really special. I know my neighbors, they put up a, a big sign saying congratulations, Ian, and I'm like, I'm very thankful for that. And, um, so that all of that was really good enough for me. The people that know me and can be proud and say, hey, I know this guy, I think that's what makes me feel the best about now being an Olympian. The high school coaches, the, the teachers, middle school, elementary school, my friends, my classmates, everybody that put positive energy towards me through this whole journey that I've started since I've been in West St. Paul, Minnesota. There's a, a video that my wife sent me of my two kids hugging after I finished. They don't really care how I did. They just want dad home. They just want to get back to normal. And I think that's sort of what I realized is like, there's a human element to this and you gotta, chill out you know yeah you want to be the best in the world but you also have to be mindful of the people who are watching and the people who are closest to you and i think that's sort of what i've taken out of this whole thing during this covid year i lost sight of like what's truly important in this sport i'm really proud of myself for realizing like i'm so much more than this sport and i just you know i don't want to become who i was before this summer ever again. I feel like my work isn't done yet. I still want to get the medal. I want the gold medal. I want to hear the national anthem and that drives me. Even though we were postponed a year, it means we're one year closer to the next games. There's some hope for me there to, to, to maybe even use that as sort of my retirement. I'm at a little path right now. I'm not sure which way I want to go to, left or right. Being an Olympian, it opens up every door. I'm really excited to kick off my my collegiate career and I just think that you know everything that I've learned it just gives me so much inspiration and motivation and hope for for some really great things ahead. I think there's more to my story. I think there's a lot there's a lot more to me before I hang up my cap and goggles.